Um, tonight is, I, I've been looking forward to tonight because we begin now to define what manhood is. We've spent the last several weeks kind of unpacking some things, and I know for some of us, uh, you hit some areas that you may not have wanted to dig down in, but I encourage you that if you're still digging down in some of that area, uh, those areas continue to dig down and let the Holy Spirit do the process that only He can do in our lives. Because the truth is, we can't, we can't hit what we're aiming at if we're still carrying baggage from the past. And God wants to free us from that. He has promised to do that, and it's a very simple process, really. It's a painful process, but the power of the Holy Spirit can free us from those things. Somebody said, if you aim at nothing, you do what? You hit nothing. Uh, you may hit a lot of things, but not the right thing. And so tonight we begin to look at what the definition of, the biblical definition of manhood, because we've got to have something to drive at, something to look at. Let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you can say that there was a time in your life that somebody definitively said, okay, now you have entered manhood? Not many of us, a couple of us. I think my dad said it when I was about to graduate from high school. I wasn't 18 yet, and I really had no plans. And he said, so where are you going to live after you graduate? <laughs> it's kind of his way of defining manhood. Uh, but every culture, many cultures around the world, uh, in some of the places that I've traveled to, and in particular my African brothers, you know, in, in many of the countries, there is a defining point that that a young man is taken, and there's usually ceremonies that surround it. He's been taught by the elders, taught by others what it is to be a man, and they have a ceremony, and officially that begins your day and your time of manhood, and you begin to step into that. Our culture, though, uh, as far as I know, have never we've never had that kind of ceremony. We're going to talk about that in Better Man, what it looks like to have that kind of moment with your son or your grandson, but there's that defining mark of manhood. And in, in our culture, there seems to be no mark of manhood. Uh, in our culture today, uh, at, at, at a certain age, it's time, okay, now you can move out of your parents' you know, basement or whatever, that kind of thing, and now you become a man. Or when you uh, get a car loan, that marks you as a man. Or when you get married, that marks you as a man. But none of that clearly defines what it is to begin a man. So we're going to be looking at... The first point is every man needs a clear definition of manhood to guide his life. There, a clear definition of what it means to be a man to guide our lives. Our options are, number one, we can make up a definition for ourselves and just hope that our definition is right. We were around the table today with Frank and Ryan and we were kind of talking about this and uh, sometimes we just have to grab at whatever our surroundings are and what we see as manhood and we put all these kind of things together but oftentimes that definition that we come up with with manhood is not right and if we're not uh, if we're not moving in progress towards those things or with those things that are right in manhood then it's not going to end up well right and so we can either make up our own definition or we can look to culture to define for us what manhood is. As I thought about that and I was looking back through my life and culture and famous people that were in my life that I kind of looked to to say that's what a man is, uh, the first image that popped into my mind, and this is only going to appeal to those that are my age and older, was Neil Armstrong. How many of you remember who Neil Armstrong was? Uh, astronaut, first astronaut to walk on the moon, and that was like, okay, that's a man. That's what defines manhood. Uh, the other man that, that, uh, that was real popular when I was a kid was John Wayne. That was a man, right? Uh, that was what a true man was. The other who was one of my young idols growing up was Cassius Clay, and then all of a sudden he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Why? Because he embraced Islam, but he was what a man was to me. And one last one that was what a man was to me, and, and you'll know that I really followed in his path, and that was Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? My name is Arnold, remember Saturday Night Live, the Arnold, I pump you up, what was it, right? Yeah, um, and you looked at Arnold, and he had that physique that all of us as young boys desired to have, right? Um, and recently, two or three years ago, maybe maybe longer than that though, after he had 
aspired to a lot of things. He even became the governor of California. And after he left office, uh, I believe it was People Magazine, did a full spread article on him as he was reflecting on his life uh, and all of the accomplishments that he had attained in life. And he was sharing in that interview that, that now at that age that he was, that he didn't like looking at himself in the mirror any longer. How many of you can relate to that? Yeah, I don't look so good in the mirror anymore, right? Uh, and so he went on to explain that as a result of the aging process, he was an inch and a half shorter than he once was. And he talked about his chest, how that his chest had shrunk now six inches. Some of us are chest shrinking six inches and, you know, there's nothing there anymore. Uh, but he made this statement in, in, the, in, the, in the article that as he, as he reflected on his life and what he once was, he said, I don't like what I see. And then he said this, but like most things, I live in denial. It was only about six months or so after that article broke that the other article broke that all of a sudden his marriage had fallen apart because of extramarital affairs. And all that Arnold Schwarzenegger may have been as a definition of a man, uh, most people now are going to remember him of the breakup of his family because he did not have a good definition or a good direction as to what it means to be a man. And he followed that path and it led to devastation in his life. The third thing he says, we can, we can look for enduring wisdom for a definition. We can look for enduring wisdom for a definition. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to pause for just a minute, and I want you to write two names, if you can, right there in the margins of your notebook. Can you think of two men in your life, however far back it might be, that you could say that, that when you look at them, you recognize that you could look to them for enduring wisdom? Take about 30 seconds. Write those two names down in your book, if you have two names. If you only have one name, write that one name down. Some of you might not be able to have a single name that you can write on that. Think real quickly. Two men that you could look at that you could say they had enduring wisdom in their life as a definition for you as what to manhood is. There are two men in my life that I look back and uh, I've known a lot of men in my life, but uh, two men that I could, without reservation, say that they were enduring wisdom, and they're really on two opposite ends of the spectrum. Both of them walked with God. Both of them had a godly definition. Uh, one was a very practical, basic, simple man. The other one was well-educated, um, and those two were my dad, who passed away five years ago this summer, and my spiritual mentor, pastoral mentor, Dr. Long, who died, who'd passed away about a year ago. And I look at those two men in my life, out of all the men that I've had in my life that I would look to for mentorship, those two stand out predominantly in my life, that I know when I look at their life, there was enduring wisdom. Jeremiah 6.16 says this, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your soul. What Jeremiah is calling us to here is to stand in the road, stand at the crossroad, if you will, and look and ask for the ancient path where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your soul. And so all of us tonight, we're here because we're wanting to be better men. We're wanting to be godly men. And so what Jeremiah calls us to is stand in the road, stand there and look for the ancient way and see where there might be one or where there's a definition that we can follow as to what this is what it means to be a godly man or a better man and define it and fall in that way. Point C says, so what is history's greatest source of enduring wisdom? What is history's greatest source of enduring wisdom? Quite simple answer, it is the Bible. Look at some of the points that are down here. No book has transformed more lives for good than the Bible has. Let me ask you a question. Some of you love to read. Harold Danforth comes to my mind when I think about reading. Harold, let me ask you a question. Of all the books you've read in the last 10 years, how many of those books have you picked up to read a second time? 
maybe two or three. All right, in the last 20 years, how many books have you read, picked up to read more than one time? Yeah, not many, right? But there is a book that is far more ancient than any book on your shelf. And it's the Word of God, and it's the Bible. And it has endured for all of this time, and there's not a one of us that can honestly say that we can't pick that book up at any time and not find enduring wisdom in it. That alone, for me, is one indication that it is the very Word of God, inspired by God itself. And we all know, if we've experienced it, that the Word of God is that one thing that can bring transformation in our lives. How many would say amen to that? Just one simple nugget from the Word of God can make a drastic change in your life and in my life as the Holy Spirit empowers that Word by the living Spirit of God in us to bring transformation in our life. You and I can learn to change our behavior, right? I can teach a monkey how to change its behavior, but I cannot change what's inside that monkey. And you and I can live the Christian life just trying to change our behavior. And depending on how disciplined you or I might be, we're just going to depend on the success that we have in trying to change our behavior. But I've learned until that inner thing in me changes, there's nothing outward that's going to change. And the only thing that has the power to change me and you inside is the Word of God by the Holy Spirit of God. I can use an amen on that one. It is the only thing that can transform us. He makes a second statement. It is history's all-time bestseller. I had a bunch of statistics I was going to read to you about that, but it really doesn't matter. Bottom line, it is the all-time bestseller of any of the book that's ever been published. Every week, 31% of the world's population looks to the Bible for guidance and help. Somebody quickly calculate 6.4 billion. What is 32% of that? Right? Mike, there you are. Who's got it? Somebody holler it out later. A lot of people, right? Every single day, turn to the Bible. The Bible laid, now this is really important, the Bible laid moral, social, and legal foundations for all of Western civilization. Now, I know today that in, in, in our country and other countries around the world, there, there are people that are crying out, criticizing Western civilization, civilization. But I would challenge any person that is criticizing Western civilization to take a trip outside of one of those countries in Western civilization and realize the impact that the Christian, the Bible influence has had on those other cultures and those other nations. I've had the opportunity to travel to over 50 countries in the world and spend time there. And without question, any country that I've ever been to that has had the influence of the Bible in their culture, the influence of the Bible in their culture, it has created a greater moral structure, social structure, and leader foundation than any other place, any other places that I've ever been to in the world. You go to any of those countries and you'll find that their legal system is based on what the scriptures teach that all of their law is based on it. Their health care in most of those countries were initiated by missionaries or others who had a Christian value-based system, a biblical worldview, and we have what we have today. Women in those cultures are treated far better than they are in any other places in the world. And lastly, you'll find that most of those countries in Western civilization have a stronger economic base. And it's not because of imperial capitalism but it's because of the principles that are found in the Word of God in that. So the Bible, the bottom line in that, is that the Bible influences every culture in some way. Every culture influenced by the truths of the Bible have flourished. Um, Let's look at point two, the Bible and manhood. The Genesis story introduces to us a timeless manhood. It's coincidental that we've been going through Genesis uh, on Sunday morning. And slowly, I understand, but there's some timeless truths that are in there that mark down for us what it means to be a man. Immediately after his creation, God calls Adam to step up in four specific life-given responsibilities that if, underline that word, if embraced, would make him truly manly. We're going to see, and we've already covered those four principles on Sunday mornings as we've gone through it, and so let your mind think as you've been hearing on Sunday mornings and reading along with me, what are those things? As sons of Adam, that's you and I, 
these manhood responsibilities have now been passed to us to guide us in our journey to better manhood. When I think about that, when God created all of creation and he created man, there were some simple four primary timeless truths that if Adam had lived up to, if you will, if he had implemented them, things would be a lot different today for you and I. But for every man, if we look at those four principles, those timeless truths in Genesis, and we apply them in our lives, we will begin to hit that target of what God defines as a real man, a godly man, or a better man. And so, a real man, let's begin looking at these four life-giving responsibilities of real manhood. Underline that word, responsibilities. Let me talk about that for just a minute. God has given you and I as men those principles, those timeless truth, and those commands as godly men. But it's our responsibility. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to live up to those and to live by those. Nobody's going to do it for us. We have to take ownership of those responsibilities as men and live up to them. So the first thing is a real man courageously follows God's word. Notice that word courageously, because guys, we all know it takes courage to follow God's word, right? I mean, you're, you're in an environment in the place that you work. You're in an environment in the way, in the places that you play. You're in an environment in the, in the places that, that you go and socialize in your community and other places. And it takes real courage in that environment to be the one that stands and says, no, this is what God's Word says, and that's what I'm going to follow. It's easy to put a placard on my front door that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's another thing to courageously stand against in opposition to say, no. We are going to follow what the Word of God says. It takes courage. Two other things that, that I thought about when I looked at this principle is not only it takes courage for us as men to, to obey God's Word, it takes great trust for us to obey God's Word, right? You think about it. Here are a couple of practical, solutions, practical answers to that. This is not a plea for money. But, but I take the one principle in Scripture that teaches us to tithe the 10% of our income. And I know the pressures of manhood in a household trying to make ends meet, right? And it takes a lot of trust for me to trust that what God's Word says, that if I give, then He is going to meet all of my needs according to His riches and glory. Not that God's going to make me rich, and this isn't a thing I give to God so He gives back to me. That's not what we're talking about. But in our giving, it takes a real act of trust and faith. Why? Because we're men, right? We're going to earn it the hard way. And by gosh, I earned it the hard way, and He's not getting 10% of it, right? But it takes real trust to trust God in those areas. Another way, in another place, it takes great trust and faith in God, in His Word, is, is, is in the area that we all face and we deal with and we struggle, especially if we're married and we have those rough patches in our marriage, that when, when, the, when the woman that we're to love is not loving us the way that we think she should, and we begin looking outside and say, well, I'm sure she'd love me the way, it takes real courage and trust in God to say, no, God, this is a woman that you gave me, and I'm going to love her, and I'm going to be faithful to her, because everywhere we turn and everywhere we go, there are plenty of opportunities to walk away from that. Can I get an amen to that? It's a faith and a trust in God. The third thing that I thought in this, not only does it take courage and trust, but thirdly, it takes humility for you and I to follow God's Word. You know what humility says? Humility says, you know better than I do. God, I'm not God. God, I don't know everything. I might think I know everything, but God, I know you know best. And when situations may dictate that I follow a different path or I think they dictate it, it takes real humility to submit myself to God's Word and be obedient to Him. So, guys, keep that in mind. Three things it takes for us to follow God's Word. Uh, courage, trust, and humility. 
Look at this statement. Unlike the animal world, man has created, man was created with a special need for personal coaching to succeed. Animals operate on what? Instinct, right? We have been created in a different manner. We've been created in his image. And while some may argue the point we have certain instincts, we do, but that's not what governs and guides our life. What governs and guides our life is what our Creator has told us and given to us and commanded to us to follow. We don't live by instinct. If we live by instinct, then we would go out and mate with everything that came along our way. That's what animals do, right? But God says, no. That's not the plan that I have for you. And so men, God has created us in a way that we need personal coaching to succeed. Look what God said to Adam, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. And we've made this point a couple of times on Sunday morning. In in all of what God had created and given to Adam. Now remember, Adam at this point is alone. Eve has not yet been created out of his side. He's alone. And God says, Adam, let me tell you, all of this in the paradise of the garden that I've given, you can eat from any fruit of the tree you'd like. There are two trees. There's one that's a tree of life, and there's a tree uh, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And from that one tree, one teeny, teeny restriction you cannot eat from. And all of that, what does Adam do? No. Adam passively sits by as he has been given the command from God himself after Eve has been created, he was there when the serpent came to Eve. He was there. He was present. The command had been given to Adam. Eve is deceived by the serpent, and she takes the fruit, and Adam passively stands by and lets Eve eat of the fruit. Do you see what's happening there? Guys, it takes courage, right, to follow the Word of God, to be obedient to the Word of God. A man begins to experience the real adventure of life-giving manhood when he courageously follows God's Word. I know before I came to Christ, before I came to know Him, I thought I was experiencing real adventure in life. And trust me, believe me, I was having fun. I was really having a blast living as a sinner. Anybody relate to that? How many of you are having fun living as a sinner, right? We thought that was adventure. But after I became born again and I began to learn to be obedient to the Word of God, I never experienced life to the fullness like I did after that. You see, the other stuff was temporal promises. That was not a clear path to biblical manhood. Real joy, real life-giving manhood comes when we courageously follow God's Word. Let me tell you something, and I don't understand why it's this way. Well, I do, because God has created the order in this way. But as a man, you can write this down. As a man, somebody is following you. As a man, somebody is following you. It may be a coworker, it may be your son, it may be a, a, a boy that's in your community, in your neighborhood. As a man, somebody is following you. God has, it has not changed since the created order. That God established it that way, that he created Adam, and out of the side of Adam, he created woman. And God called man, has called man, to be leaders in our culture, in our world, in our homes, in our families. Somebody is following you. The question that I have to ask myself, are they following me? Am I walking the right way? Are they following what is a godly way? Look at what uh, God says to Joshua. 
after he's taken over from Moses. Now, you've got to understand the iconic figure that Moses was with the children of Israel. I mean, Moses is the one that God used to deliver them from 400 years of captivity in Egypt. Moses is the one that, that lifted his arms and, and the sun stood still. Moses is the one that stepped his foot into the sea, into the river, and it parted its way. Moses was the one that God used to deliver the children of Israel of Egypt with all of those miraculous signs. And for 40 years, he's leading them. And now Moses is about to die. And God says to Joseph, who, Joseph, uh, to Joshua, who was going to take over, and says, be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all that God commanded. Be strong and courageous. Here Joshua is coming in under the shadows of Moses, and it seems to be that the only instruction that God gives to Joshua as he's going to cross into the promised land, and he knows that there are going to be enemies there that they face. They're going to be lands and, and cities that they have to conquer. They're outnumbered. It doesn't look like a very good situation to be walking into, right? And he tells Joshua, Joshua, be strong and be courageous and do what? Follow all that God has commanded. Now, I know in immediate application, God was speaking to, to Joshua. But in our lives, guys, tonight, in the application in our lives of this verse, God's saying, listen, be strong and be courageous and obey all that I've commanded you. That is the path and that's the road to godly lives as men. It's something I, I, I wrote down a long time ago, and, and I, I looked at the example of Jesus in that, in that, in that, in that call to leadership as man. Leadership is influence. It's not commanding. Leadership is influence. It's not, put it another way, it's not barking out commands. You see, sometimes we get the idea that, that leadership, as God has called us to men to be leaders, is that to be a leader, we learn to tell people what to do and command them how to do it, to do it our way, to do it this way. But I've learned that real leadership, and this is after looking at Jesus' life and his model of leadership, leadership is all about influencing, not commanding. Somebody may argue the point. Jesus gave commands. He did. He quoted the Father's command. But Jesus influenced others to those things by his walking out in those and demonstrating and influencing others through his life what it is to be a godly man. Leadership is all about influence. It's not about commanding. So jot that down. Maybe the Holy Spirit will bring that back to your mind sometime to apply. Second point is, first one was a real man courageously follows God's word. Second one is a real man loves and protects God's woman. A real man loves and protects God's woman. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. This is a prototype here, guys, if you really think into it. The Lord God fashioned into a woman from the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Now, there's a lot of time, we don't know how much time, that kind of passed from when God had created Adam to the time that, that he took from his, his side the rib and fashioned woman. It was long enough for Adam to be there and Adam to really contemplate and watch the animals to look at them so that he could name them based on their characteristics and all of that stuff. It was long enough for Adam to recognize that there's the one thing that all of the an these animals have that I don't have. What was that? A mate. And it was from that that I think God did for an intentional purpose in Adam's life to make him realize that there's something missing. Now, that's not to mean that God didn't do something good. God did. But God wanted Adam to realize there's something missing. And what's missing is what all the animals have, and that's a partner for life. Now, here's the prototype that, that God takes from the side of Adam a rib, and from that rib, he 
fashions woman. What's the prototype there? Think about it. The prototype is this, that from man, God created woman that would be a completer of him. Not to be in competition with him. Not to be subdued by him. He said subdue all of creation. He didn't say subdue Eve, right? But the prototype there for you and I is to realize that that there's a great need that you and I have as men. And God has fashioned that from so that we might be complete and the two will become one flesh. Lord God fashioned into a woman from the rib which he had taken from the man. The command in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. I don't know of anything harder in the world than to lay down my life for my wife. Anybody say amen to that? Especially on days that <laughs> she doesn't exactly merit it, right? But that's what he calls us to. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, do any of us succeed at that completely all the time? Absolutely not. I heard a guy years ago, and early on we were married, and we come to say we went to a marriage conference. And the guy looked at all of the husbands, and all of us husbands, and said, Men, if your wife is not loving you the way that you think she ought to love you, it's because you're not loving her the way that Christ has called you to love her. They are responders. And here he calls us to lay our lives down for them as Christ laid his life down for the church. Not to try to change them into what we think they ought to be. I nearly destroyed my marriage early on by trying to make Sandy what I wanted her to be. If you know Sandy, you know that Sandy is very outgoing and vicarious, right? She's Cuban. It doesn't register here before it comes out here, right? She's very expressive. She's very outgoing. And I'm pretty much the opposite. And I I realized that there was a pattern that began to take place in my life that I became embarrassed by her outgoingness. Really, it wasn't embarrassment as much as it was my ego thinking that she outshone me, right? And so we would go to people's houses for dinner. Maybe we'd go to gatherings, and we would leave those, and I began to correct her on the way that she had acted in the company of others. It embarrassed me. And I wanted to change her, and it dawned on me one day, this is still after I'm saved, and I didn't realize that I was just crushing her. I was trying to make her into something that she's not, and what I didn't realize are those very things that were irritating me now, those are the very things that attracted me to her when we got married. I was always nitpicking her. You don't do it right this way. Follow me. Do it this way. And I was, I, I, and I look back at it and I think, how I wish some older guy had said to me, hey, bonehead, quit treating your wife that way. The Lord did a work in that, and I thank God he did, because she would have had every reason to say, you know what, I'm not going to stay with this jerk. There's some change that had to take place here. And guys, some of us, and me included, there's still some changes in our lives that need to take place so that we love our wives like Christ loved the church. We can't fashion them into what we want them to be. God has fashioned them into what he desires for them to be. Amen? Now, let me talk to the guys that aren't married. Some of you checked out in that. I'm not married. You may be someday. I'm not married anymore. Okay. Specifically, we've been talking about the woman that God has given us to as a wife. But I think the application for men in the body of Christ 
He said, we're to treat every woman this way. Can I get an amen to that? Women are looking for men. Let me rephrase that. Uh, um, I, yeah. <laughs> My wife made this statement, so I'll blame her. My wife said, you know, godly men are sexy men. You want to be a sexy man? Be a godly man. Amen? A real man excels at God's work, point C. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to care for it. Vocation, from the Latin word vocare, meaning a call. Work is a man's call to serve God. And we've done a horrible job in the church with this word vocation. Is that from the Latin, we get the word call. We get the idea that, that only those who are called to ministry are viable. But in, that, in the original roots of that word, every single one of us have a call from God. And that call can be worked out, that call can be lived out in any vocation as long as what we do is we are doing it for God and we're doing it to His glory. So, so get out of your mind that, that, that you don't have a call in your life. I remember when I was in electrical contract, I recognized and realized that, that my influence, the callings in my life of God, while the vocation was not ministry vocation, there was a very important call to the men that worked for us in our company that I interacted with on a daily basis and guys that I bought material from. No matter what it is that you're doing in life, don't undervalue it. I say this a lot of times, that I had far more influence and impact in God's lives who had not come into a relationship with Christ through my employment as, as, a, as an electrical contractor than I ever have as a pastor in vocational ministry. And can I tell you this? That, that if, if, if one has the idea that they, they don't arrive until they get that recognition of that ordination, et cetera, as, as a pastor or whatever in vocational ministry... We completely missed it. God has called every single one of us, and He wants us to bring glory to His name in that calling. He says in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. It is the Lord Christ who you serve. That puts a different factor on whether or not I am living to make a certain amount of sales to impress my boss or to fill my bank, bank account. is when I look and realize that, that I, God has called me, He's called you to vocation and that calling so that we might bring glory to His name. Amen? Fourth, a real man betters God's world. Look at the command in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Let's look at that first one. There are two, two commands here. He tells them, look, in all of creation, I want you to subdue it. There's something about what God has done in man that, that, that we want to conquer whatever it is there before us. When I was 40 years of age, I came upstairs one day and I told to Sandy, I said, I said to her, I said, you know, I'm going to start training to run a marathon. And she said, what? I've never mentioned it. Why in the world would you run a marathon? I said, because it's there, right? I mean, it's there. Why not? God's wired us in a way that, that he has made us that we're to go out and subdue. There's the challenge there. And and, and there's nothing wrong at all. It's the way God has fashioned us to go after stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking to go after stuff so we can accumulate more stuff on this earth where rust and malt destroys, but, but God has created us as, as inter, in, uh, innovators. And, and I think God, there's so many pent-up gifts in men in the body of Christ that He wants to use. My goodness, if we just tap into that. 
and allow God to use us in the way that he wants to. There could be so much that we could subdue for his glory. The second command in this is to multiply. There's no greater way that you and I can change our world around us than the influence that we have on our own kids or our grandkids. No greater impact. Let me have you think for a minute. Uh, how many of you have a project you're working on right now at work? Raise your hand. A deadline, a project. Matt, you're an app developer. I'm going to use you. Okay? Um, the, the, the best app that you've ever written. Everybody know what apps are? Okay? Best app you've ever written. Has it ever brought world change? Okay. Will it be effective 10 years from now? No, right? I'm not, and I'm not degrading your work. Andy, you're an engineer. Are you working on an engineering project right now? Okay. Um, is it going to change the world? Okay. Um, now engineering, it doesn't change as fast as technology does, but, but do you think it'll have a 100-year legacy? No. 50-year legacy? No. 25-year legacy? No. Okay. Point is this. Guys, in our vocation, the things that we do, we can have a short-term impact. But do you really want to have a big impact? You want to have an impact that will last for generations? It's right there in your own home. That's the greatest influence that you and I can have. You've got three little ones, right? Yeah. Greatest impact you can have right now is right there in your own home. It can change generations that when you're dead and gone and way gone, my goodness, listen, listen to what he says. A good dad is a real man. Psalm 127, 3 to 5. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. One last question on this. Is there anybody in here tonight, and somebody's going to show me up, I know. Is there anybody here tonight that remembers the full name, first, middle, and last, of your great-grandfather? Two of you. Three of you. Do you remember it because you read their name or was in some genealogy or because of the impact they had in your life? Most likely it was because you just read their name in a genealogy somewhere. How many of you can, uh, can quote the, fir- the full name of your grandfather, first, middle, and last? Okay, a few more. How many of you can quote the first, middle, and last name of your father? Everybody in the room. The point there is this, that even in our family, most of us have no idea who our great-grandfather was. Some of us can remember first, middle, and last of our grandfather, but our father, and as you and I, as dads and granddads, we have the opportunity to make a lasting impact, not only in that individual's life, but in generations to come. So what defines a real man? What's life-giving manhood? Point four. A real man courageously follows God's word, loves and protects God's woman, excels at God's work, and betters God's world with his children. There it is. That is the definition of what it means to be a real man or a better man. It's there. All of those principles come out of what God had conveyed to Adam way out, way long ago in creation. Courageously follows God's word, Love and protects God's woman, excels at God's work, and betters God's world, in parentheses, with his children. You see, Adam tragically stepped away from God's call into real manhood, resulting not in a better life for him and his wife, but in a lesser, harder one. In a moment, in a major moment of testing, Adam refused to follow God's word. He also failed to love and protect his wife. Adam had opportunity there when the serpent was standing there. He's showing that fruit to Eve, questioning God's word, questioning God's command. Adam had the opportunity to step in and say, wait a minute, pal. This is my woman. (laughs) He didn't. He passively stood by. 
Today, as sons of Adams, we too have the choice of stepping up into life-giving manhood or stepping away into a lesser manhood of our own design. And what we're going to build on this week and the weeks to come is we're going to dig deeper, dig down in these areas. We're going to pray and depend on the Holy Spirit of God to work in our lives with one another as iron sharpens iron to be better men, to be godly men. Here's some practical implications of this definition. This is, a, this is a manhood that every man with God's help can aspire to. Every one of us can step in to this definition. There's not a one of us that can't. I don't care how much we've screwed up in the past. There's not a one of us that can't step into it and begin to grow and live it out from the day, this day forward in our lives. Man, uh, be strong and show yourself a man. Kings chapter 2, verse 2. This is what David said to Solomon. Solomon, be strong and show yourself as a man. I, 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 I can't, sometimes I have a lot of, I don't say it as much as I think it. I, I'm getting older and now the older I'm getting, the bad thing is I'm beginning to say what's on my mind, <laughs> right? But sometimes I just want to look at a guy and say, man, be a freaking man. Take your tutu off. Put your big pants on and be a man. Give me 10 years and I'll be saying it to everybody. <laughs> right? Guys, God's called us to be men. God's called us to be leaders. God's, God's, God's given it there to us. Your being here is an indication that, that we all want to be that. You wouldn't be here if we didn't. And, and I'm a dreamer, guys. I'm, 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 I'm entrepreneurial, and I love to, to see things. I, I, without question, I have confidence. Guys, in our body, we as men, we step into these things. We begin to live these things out. We begin to encourage each other. We, we begin to implement these things, and we see one another fall in them. We say, hey, man, don't worry about it. Get up. I'm going to walk with you in this thing. So you screwed it up. Big deal. Right? I'm afraid what the church has done, you screwed it up. Now you're not one of us. There's not a one of us in here that hadn't screwed it up in some way. Amen? But there's no limit to what God can do through this group of men who say, well, we want to be better men. We want to be godly men. We want to support each other. We want to love each other. We want to help each other in this. There's no limit to what God can do. Do you, do you feel it, man? Do you, do you feel it with me? I need you and you need me, though, to do that. Let me move on. I'm preaching now. This is a manhood that can serve as one's life compass. It's a manhood that can serve as life's one compass. If you think of a compass, the top point of that compass is what? No, we could, no it's not north. True. Do I have any Boy Scouts here? It's true north. And that's God's principles. That's true north. That's the way we want to head. The east and west, think of, think of, where do we mess it up most? With women and work. We're heading to that true north. Get the balance in these areas in our life and live it right. South is, man, I'm leaving that behind. That's the junk in the trunk. I had a bad connotation to it, didn't I? <laughs> This definition, guys, it's kind of dumbed down for us men, right? We just need it plain and practical. It's a compass for us. This is a manhood that women long for. This is a manhood that dads can confidently call their sons to. This manhood, you and I can confidently call our sons. And maybe not necessarily our sons, but let's put it in the context of the body. Us guys that are older, 
have influence on younger, whatever. We don't have kids at home anymore. There, there's a room full of boys up here every Wednesday night when we're back to normal routine. And guys, we can have an impact on them. We can call every one of them to this biblical manhood. Masculinity can only be taught. Men teach and call younger boys into it. This is a manhood that history affirms. History has repeatedly described manhood in terms of four dominions, domains, religion, family, work, and community. I'll try to elaborate on that one a little bit later when we hit this. Um, but this is manhood that promises deeply satisfying rewards. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. abundantly. You've heard me say this, that when I look at my dad's life and I looked at Dr. Long's life, the two men that had such influence in my life, at the end of their lives, my dad was in an assisted living facility and all that he possessed was right there in those two little rooms with him. Dr. Long had been moved over here to Remington and from, a, from his home into there to spend out his last couple of years. And, and all that they had accumulated in life we're in those small rooms that they were in. You know what I mean? All, all this stuff kind of boils down to that. But the thing that both of them had in their dying days were a drove of individuals that were still living that came to see them that knew that they were approaching life's door to give respects to them and to say, well, you had an impact in my life. Hundreds of individuals. They were both 84 years of age. Most of their friends had died. The question for me and you is, when we're there, will we have that drove of people, young and old? Or will our life's circle diminish as we get older to a fewer and fewer and they all die off and there's nothing left back here? I don't know about you. But I want to see that there's a train of folks. Not for popularity. This is the only chance I have of living, leaving a legacy. A legacy of a building isn't anything. But a legacy of lives impacted for God's kingdom. I can't think of anything better. That's what I want to leave. Here are the rewards. Quickly, I'll hit them. The reward of courageously following God and His Word, real freedom in life. The reward of loving and protecting God's woman, deep, intimate companionship called oneness. The reward for excelling at God's work, success and influence. The reward for bettering God's world, gladness and joy as a dad. Lastly, the true superhero is a real man. It's a 30 day challenge there. The 30 day challenge is this for you to take that definition of manhood, and Harold's going to be passing out the cards now, he and Chad would. Because I know we're a group of men, right? If I said 30 day challenge is to placard this thing on your dash so you look at it every day, some of you might go home and write it out on a three by five card. Most of us wouldn't, right? <laughs> so Becky helped us out tonight by putting these on a little card. And the 30-day challenge is to look at that definition every single day of the week, whatever's the most appropriate place for you to place it. Put it there, quote that definition, and I promise you that through the 30 days, as we begin to focus on this, God, like a laser, will begin to bring change in our lives so that we become better men. Um, I love you. Uh, in your groups tonight... Um, Share with one takeaway with each other. Tonight was really kind of an introduction to the next part. Small group time discussions are, are a little, little bit more limited tonight. Let's go ahead and break into our table groups and let's talk through these things, okay?